Hi guys, welcome to Sandals Church and welcome to this series called Holy Shift. Look, I wanna challenge you to do something radical today. I wanna challenge you to shift the way you view Jesus and specifically the way you view one of his most famous teachings he ever gave. Today I wanna to talk about learning to love your enemy. How many of you guys are struggling lo loving your, like your spouse, amen? Like anybody <laughs> struggling to, to love your kids, <laughs> right? Struggling to love like, you know, people that you're like, I don't even know if I like you anymore. And so there's so many of us, like we see this teaching, we're like, oh, pastor, I need the JV sermon. I, I'm not ready for varsity. You know, I got my floaties on. Don't push me in the deep end today. But we're gonna shift this today. We're really gonna shift um, the way that you think about things. So we're gonna start with a word called repentance. How many of you guys have heard of that word, okay? If you're new to church, you've never heard of that word, but that's what it requires to have a right relationship with God. So in English, we say repent, but in Greek, it's metaneo. And the word means a complete shift in the way one thinks. And that's what God's inviting us to, a holy shift where we change the way we think. So let's jump right into this super difficult teaching. And I'm gonna pray that God speaks you, to you today and you will change ready to shift and ready to say, God, this is, this is, this is how I wanna be. This is who you've called me to be. And, and you're gonna leave here a changed person. So we begin in Matthew chapter five, verses 43 through 44. And Jesus is repeating something that people have heard. Okay, this is not new information. It's hard information. You know, like when you go to the doctor, you should exercise, you should eat better, right? This isn't like new information. He says, you've heard it said that you shall love your neighbor. Now be a good neighbor. And you shall hate your enemy. Whoa, whoa. He says, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who perse persecute you. And you're like, I'm out, pastor. I'm out. I'm out. I'm not even going to pray for you today, pastor, much less, you know, my enemies. Because we all struggle with this, right? But hating someone is a serious problem. Confucius said this, if you hate a person, you are already defeated by them. Now, some of you are like, I thought this was Christian. Amen. We are a Christian church. All religions have truth. The difference is Jesus is the truth. That's the difference. Confucius was right on that. When you hate someone, you've already lost. You've already been defeated. And so many of us, we struggle with this. So Jesus says you're to love your enemy. Now, here's the thing I want to challenge you today. In order to love my enemy, I have to identify my enemy. Who's my enemy? Who am I fighting? Oh man, I love the book of Psalms, man. If you're ever depressed or you feel like you're the worst Christian ever, read Psalms. You will feel so good about yourself. You'll be like, Lord, I'm not that bad. I mean, this guy, David, he, he, may, he may have had a, a heart after you, but his mind was crazy. <laughs> and this is what David said. You ever, you ever felt like this? I am surrounded by my enemies who are like lions hungry for human flesh. This may be the first tweet. <laughs> their teeth are like spears and arrows and their tongues are like sharp swords. Anybody feel like that? My kids are always trying to get me to go to coffee shops. I hate going to coffee shops because I don't know who likes me. I don't know who doesn't. I'm just gonna get my, my, my coffee in Starbucks and I don't judge me but I just get in Starbucks and, and go on through. Because not everybody likes me. I know that's hard for you to imagine. <laughs> so so positive and encouraging and uplifting. But I just, I just don't know. I, I don't always know who my enemies are. Let me ask you, who are your enemies? And you're like, everybody likes me. No, 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 that's not true. They just haven't been honest with you yet. Yeah. Who are your enemies? Who are the people that are against you? We need to know this. And some of us feel safe and secure. That's why Jesus said, oh, Jerusalem, one day your enemies will, will surround you on every side and they will come for you. Who are your enemies? Here's what I want you to know. Number two, my enemies are usually closer than I think. <laughs> Amen. Remember that guy you fell in love with, couldn't live without? Uh, yeah, your, your ex, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. One of my favorite quotes is this, keep your friends close and what? Your enemies closer. My wife and I, we were watching uh, the movie, The Finest Hour. 
And Winston Churchill may be one of the most misunderstood leaders in human history. And when he's appointed as uh, prime minister, nobody likes him. Nobody wants him, but nobody else will take the job because they're losing. Like, he just took over the Titanic, amen? He's like, yeah, we're done. And so literally, all, all the entire British army is in, is in retreat. They're running from the Germans. They're losing. And they may not be able to save them. And so nobody will take the job, but Winston Churchill will take the job. And all his enemies who appoint him, they want to run out the door. He said, no, 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 guys, you're in the council with me. And he says, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Listen to what Jesus said. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoa. So who is my enemy? Who's my enemy? Now, some of you have been really hurt. I mean, one of the things that I'm always shocked as your pastor is the painful things that people in our church have had to endure. And it reminds me, I've had a pretty blessed life, a pretty blessed life. But some of you have endured real suffering, and for that, I'm sorry. But most of us, our enemy, the person that we hate, the person that we loathe, is just somebody who teased us, amen? Somebody who taunted us. You're like my older brother. You know, they made you taste spit or something when you were four years old, you know. <laughs> they held you down, scared you. For most of us, man, we hate people that just teased us. And the truth is, if we were powerful enough, if we were really powerful, if we were king, we'd have got rid of that person. Amen? Amen, little brothers, little sisters. <laughs> but did you know that kings actually used to hire that person? It was called the court jester. And here's why. Here's how you knew if you had a good king, can the king take a joke? Can the king be teased? When he kills the jester, you have a tyrant. <laughs> what have we done in our culture? We've killed the comic. You see, the comic is the last person that can speak truth to power. And oftentimes that person that teased you was pointing out something that maybe it was true. The question is, can you take the joke or not? That's what's wrong with our culture. We can't take a joke anymore. We can't take a joke anymore, listen to me, because we can't handle the truth anymore. There was a comic strip from 1948 to 1975 in America. You've, some of you, most of you have never heard of this. Many of our young people have never read a comic strip anymore, right? <laughs> there used to be these things called newspapers, okay? And they were delivered to your front porch by young children workers like myself <laughs> who are not being paid a decent wage. And I know, I know you're oppressed. I know you're oppressed with your $25 an hour at Del Taco. <laughs> but, but I got paid if people answered the door. When I was 12. But I used to deliver a paper, rain or shine, and I had to pay for the bags. I know. Cry me a river. <laughs> but there was this comic strip called Pogo, okay? And all the old people are like, oh my gosh, he's relating to us, yes. <laughs> and, his, and the lead character was a possum. Now, I think possums are gross. And if you don't think so, you've never seen one. They're disgusting, large rats. And their only skill is to play dead. <laughs> but Pogo the possum, as our court jester in America, helped us to see ourselves. And it's one of the most famous quotes ever written. And it was in a comic strip. He said, we have met the enemy and he is us. And he's staring in a mirror. Listen to me, as long as your life is focused on your enemies on the outside, you will never defeat the enemy within. Write this down. Here's the shift. Here's the holy shift. And some of you are like, holy crap. I am my worst enemy. I was meeting with a good friend this week. Um, and uh, does anybody have a doomsday friend? Like, he, he, he's not going to like that I call him a doomsday friend, but, but he's close to a doomsday. He was one of those guys during COVID that he had a year's supply of flour, a year's supply of fresh water. Like, he bought all the ammunition that was for sale. He has guns in every room. He has an evacuation plan. You know, if he could afford a helicopter, he's one of those guys. But you know, like so many of us in COVID, we've, we've, we've experienced some marriage problems, haven't we? Why? We met the enemy and he is us. 
You know what happened? That quality time was way too much time, right? Too much quality. And it revealed some real challenges, some real problems. And here's the thing. His wife wants to file for separation. She wants him out of the house. And here's what I said to him. I said, you spent the last two years protecting your family from everyone and everything but yourself. And his wife begged him to get help, begged him to connect, pleaded with him. He forgot to protect his family from himself. Listen to me, parents. I know so many of you are paranoid. You love to watch the news. All the ways that your kids can be kidnapped, sexually abused, destroyed, all of these things. Let me tell you something. The most dangerous thing to your children is your parenting. You know what's probably not going to wreck your kids? A stranger. You know what's probably going to destroy your kids? All of your brokenness that you've never dealt with. I look at my adult children, and it's like a mirror. Oh, yeah, I recognize that dysfunction. (laughs) I recognize that brokenness. I see that sin. You know, Tammy and I sometimes argue over whose sin it is that our kids are displaying. (laughs) I just tell my kids, the first 10 counseling sessions, it's on dad. It's on dad. But let me ask you something. If you're not living the life that you want to live right now, who didn't do their homework? Teenagers. Teenagers crack me up. I don't want my brain to grow. I want to stay just like I am. Lord help us. Who doesn't eat healthy? Who is is that? Who's in charge of putting food in your mouth? Who doesn't want to go to sleep at night? Americans have a sleep problem. I should rest, but I can't. I'm going to watch this Netflix show that's going to change my life. And the next thing you know, it's Tuesday, and you started on Thursday. (laughs) What happened? Why can't you make friends? Oh, it's everybody else. I remember this woman came up to me years ago. What's the problems with all the guys at Sandals Church? They aren't men, and they can't step up. Maybe it's your approach. Some of you can't keep friends. Is it always everybody else's fault? Some of you can't get married. Some of you can't stay married. I met somebody this week who told me their dad's on their seventh marriage. What what number do you go? Hmm. Maybe it's this guy. Let me ask you this. Who constantly watches things they shouldn't? Who does that? Who is wasting your one and only life? It's you. It's you. 1,600 years ago, there was a Catholic monk, and his name is Evagrius Ponticus. Bright, brilliant. He's one of the most educated Christian leaders of that time. Formally educated, can read and write in multiple languages. Everything's going his way falls in love with a married woman who happens to be married to a politician and is powerful. He almost gets killed. And he's banished to the desert for the remainder of his life. Do you know that he lived in a cell for most of uh, the rest of his life, almost all day, 20 hours a day? He ate once a day. He rarely spoke to others. And he rejected all of the world's enticements for the rest of his life. Fancy, fancy foods, nice clothes, comfort. Sex, he thought if I just get rid of everything, I'll find peace. In the middle of his cell, alone at night, he finally met his problem, himself. Himself. That's where the Enneagram comes from. And I know your friends all think it's witchcraft. (laughs) Evagoras Ponticus, a monk who isolated himself, realized He had three real problems, three huge ways. Not only that he saw himself struggling, but he saw his fellow monks struggle. The first thing he identified is people struggle instinctually. You ever do something, you don't know why you do it? My wife and I have this ongoing fight, pray for us. She likes to tell me how to drive. She likes to tell me where where, where to make a turn. 
And I inform her all the time, you know, when you're not with me in the car, it's amazing how I make myself, for, make my way from, from A to B. But here's inevitably what happens when I rant and rail about how I'm the pastor and the spiritual leader of our home. We'll be driving and I miss my turn. And I go, why didn't you say anything? She's like, I was just letting you be our spiritual leader. <laughs> Have you ever had this? You're driving down the highway or the road for a period of time and you don't even remember the last two minutes. And like, you didn't smoke weed, you haven't been drinking. You know, you're just like, uh, I'm in another city. These are the animal-like qualities that we all have that just kind of take control. And this is how many of you live. You, never, you don't ever think about what you do. The apostle Paul said it this way. He says, and I know that nothing good lives in me. That is, listen to this, in my sinful nature. Like we all think nature's good. Nature's trying to kill you, it hates you. You don't believe me, go camping. The Lord made me for hotels, amen? amen? I'm a fragile man. <laughs> Look, listen, this is the Apostle Paul. He says, I want to do what's right, but I can't. I want to do what's good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. Last weekend at church, I got to, to be live at Hunter Park for the first time in a while, and I love to be out in the lobby with, with, with the people. I think it's really important as a pastor. And there was a, an exceptionally long line of people to talk to me because I hadn't been here in a couple weeks. And there was, a, there was a young man, and I could tell he wasn't okay, and he was crying. And finally, he made his way up to me, and he said, Pastor, I did something terrible. He said, I knew it was wrong but I did it anyway. I said, what'd you do? He said, I got my girlfriend pregnant and we aborted that baby this week. And he just started sobbing. He said, I knew it was wrong. Listen to this, but I did it anyway. Here's the thing, when we're afraid, we slip right into that instinctual category that self-preserves, even if it means it costs the life of someone else. He said, I can't believe I did something that terrible. I said, it is terrible. He said this, he said, I don't know if I'll ever be able to forgive myself. I said, I don't know if you will be able to either. So let's start with God because he's a better forgiver than we are. But if you're not careful, listen to me, you're going to find yourself doing horrible things because you just by nature self-protect. And what that means, if we don't think about it, we're more concerned with our own protection than we are the life of someone else. And so many of us, man, we, we're, we're so critical, we judge people. I mean, the, the level of arrogance in our society as we look down on those who came before us, is it's immense. Just know this, everybody's struggling. Everybody is instinctual. It's why Jesus, when he hung on the cross, said this, Father, forgive them. Listen, they don't know what they're doing. They're just on autopilot. Next, Evagoras said this, people struggle with their feelings. You say, what's wrong with, what's wrong with our culture? Everybody's following their feelings. Evagoras realized we must have a deep distrust for our hearts. Jeremiah said this, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things. What's wrong with your life? So many of you are following your passions. You're following your heart. Listen to what Jeremiah says. It is desperately wicked. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, I, I feel like, period, the Lord has spoken. There's another sentence. Who really knows how bad it is? Whoa, isn't that crazy? You know, the person I've hurt the most is my wife, and she's the one I love the most. I mean, it, it, it's amazing. My kids, I adore them. My, my parents. I remember vividly as a 21-year-old, fresh out of the military, coming home. My mom wanted to spend time with her son. 
So she went to the mall to get some new clothes for me because I'd lost so much weight when I was in the military. I remember vividly watching my mother convulse with sobs because of something I'd said or did in the car. And I'm like, who hurts their mother like that? Well, I was just sharing how I felt. That's the heart. The heart is desperately wicked. And what does everybody run around saying? Follow your heart. You would be better served to just follow the devil. At least he has some wisdom, amen? And some of you, you just keep doing that. You just keep doing that. Can I just be honest with you? Sometimes I love what's bad for me. I got a friend of mine, he's just like deathly allergic to, to milk. And he's always eating ice cream. And it's not just bad for him, it's bad for everyone around him. <laughs> Okay, it affects us all. I'm like, what are you doing? You know what happens when you do that. And he just says, it's just, it's just too good to pass up. Isn't that crazy? Some of us don't care. Do you know why that is? Because you're your own enemy. The heart lies, doesn't it? That's why we say this, it's sinfully good. That's an oxymoron. It's not, it's not true. Yet something can't be sinful and good, but we say it. Can I just be honest with you? Sometimes I can't feel the love that people have for me. There are days where I don't feel like I'm loved. Do you know that's a lie? My heart is lying. And so many of our young people today, they're listening to their hearts. They feel like they matter to no one. Do you know what that is? That's your heart speaking. It's not God. It's not God. Sometimes, man, I feel like there's nothing worthy at all to love in me because my heart's a liar. And so is yours. Next, people struggle with their thoughts. Oh my gosh, I hate my brain. Right at about 11 o'clock at night. My brain has a sensor when my head hits the pillow, it says, let's think of everything that went wrong today. And let's think about all the things we cannot change today. And let's not sleep for the rest of the evening. <laughs> Listen to what God says. We talked about this last week. God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. God rests well, amen? Genesis doesn't say, and on the seventh day, the Lord tried to rest. <laughs> It says, he rested. He rested. We have a hard time shutting off our brains. That's why all of your kids are running around with speakers constantly in their ears. I can't be alone with myself even for a second. I gotta listen to constant information. We, we don't know how to be alone with ourselves. My wife and I were watching the Today Show and they, 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 they went on a tour of a quiet room and one of the things they were told before they went in the quiet room where there was total silence, they said this, you can only stay in for 10 minutes. Do you know why? People go crazy. We don't know how to be alone with our thoughts. Isn't that scary? Rather than deal with the problem, nobody knows how to be in total silence for more than 10 minutes. We just say, don't do it. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as high as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. I just think God's funny. Psalms 94, 11, the Lord knows people's thoughts and he knows they're worthless. The scariest verse in the New Testament is whenever Jesus says, and he knew what they were thinking. At least I get to lie to my wife when she asks, amen. <laughs> what are you thinking? Nothing. <laughs> Wasn't thinking at all about murdering all of these people. <laughs> never, never crossed my mind. Why would you think that I would think that? You know? Isn't that crazy? Jesus knew what they were thinking. You know what no one's ever written a book, at least as far as I know. 
I know all my little researchers out there will find it for me if I'm wrong, but I don't think anybody has ever written a book called How to Have Bad Thoughts. <laughs> has anybody ever heard of a book, How to Be More Negative? How to amplify your discouragement. How to immerse yourself more accurately in depression. Like none of those books exist. We do that on our own, amen? We do. One of my favorite books I've ever read is written by an author named Jordan Peterson. And he wrote a book called The 12 Rules of Life. It's one of the greatest books. And let me tell you, I read a lot. I read a lot. It's one of the greatest books I've ever read. One of my favorite comments about my book, and God bless everyone who's posted this on, on, on my book stuff, but you should just read the Bible. Thank you. Look, the Bible is the only book we have that shows us how to be saved, but there are thousands of books that can help us to actually live like saved people. And, and for those of you who only read the Bible, maybe you should read something else to help you, especially with your comments on someone else's Instagram. Because they're not, they've not been baptized in Jesus yet. But I want you to hear me. So we, we began today's sermon with, you've heard it said. He's not quoting the Bible. He's quoting other authors, other writers, other thinkers. Jesus doesn't say, you should only read the Bible. He says, hey guys, you've heard this said. Here's what he's saying. It's okay to have contemporary thoughts about how to best obey the commands of God. He doesn't rebuke the other writings. He doesn't rebuke the other sayings. He says, look, this is what people have said about this. Here's what I'm telling you. On this specific topic, on a current topic of the day. Who is my neighbor and who is my enemy? It was something that was talked about, written about, discussed, and it's okay. So the rabbis speak about this, about how to live it out, how to live out what the Bible says. And that's why Christians write other books. So let me, let me just hear, tell you what Jordan Peterson says that is so profound. He said, people think they think. Let me, I'm going to say that again because you're like, I never thought about that. <laughs> People think they think. He says, but it's not true. It's mostly self-criticism that passes for thinking. You think you're thinking, you're just beating yourself up. You're just destroying yourself. Out of that time alone in his cell, Evagoras identified three ways in which we struggle instinctually, feeling and thinking, and he identified, wait for it, nine evil thoughts that human beings struggle with. It's stinking thinking. And we all have it. We all have it. We have seen the enemy, and he is us. So instinctually, I get in my own way. I remember Tammy and I were having an argument one time and I finally just said, I don't know what I'm doing. I've never been a husband before. I've never been a dad before. And let me just say this. So many of you that are so critical of your spouse, no one sat them down and said, here's a healthy way to be a wife. Here's a healthy way to be a husband. And all of you who are so critical of your parents, you didn't come with instructions. There's no owner's manual. When we had our first kid, we thought Madison had a fever. Turns out we just wrapped her like an Eskimo. Right? What's wrong? Does she have the flu? No, bad parents. <laughs> oh. Literally, our doctor looked at me and Tammy and said, she's just a little person. Whatever temperature you are, she is. I was all, oh. <laughs> that makes sense. She's a little person. She's experiencing the world <laughs> as we are. Poor Madison sweating to death. Oh my gosh. You know, you see all those moms with the baby wrapped in their breasts. If the baby could talk, it'd be like, I'm hot. It's really hot. 
Oh, they look so comfortable. No, they're ready to pass out because they're overheating. <laughs> Can you imagine if you had to spend the whole day wrapped like that? Just a big puddle of sweat right here. Just mama's love. But we don't know how to love. You know, I mean, I know every parent, you know, as a teenager, you're like, oh my gosh, they're dating. Oh my God. And you know, it's a train wreck. It, you just don't know when it's going to crash. And listening to teen teenagers, I'm not being critical of you. You don't even know how to love yourself, much less someone else. It's going to crash. The train's going off the tracks. There's a cliff ahead. Wile E. Coyote just ran by. <laughs> it's over. Why is that? We don't know how to love. We don't. My grandfather, who passed away this last year, loved Jesus, served Jesus. When I, when I would tell him, I love you, Grandpa, he, <laughs> he didn't even know what to do. We don't know how to love. And we don't know how to think, do we? We think we do. I mean, think about how your thinking messes you up. Most of the things that we're afraid of are things that are never gonna happen. But you're gonna die anyways because of them. Isn't that crazy? Most of our fears are about the future and we have no idea, but we play this movie in our minds where it always ends in disaster and everyone dies. And we, we never learn, do we? Listen to what Paul says. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Who can free me from my instincts? When I wanna do what's right, I inevitably do what's wrong. When I wanna follow my heart, I screw it up. When I try to sit down and think about it and come up with a strategy, I make it worse. I mean, sometimes, Tammy and I are in a disagreement and I'm trying with all my abilities not to make it worse. And yet, the very thing that comes out of my mouth is fuel on the fire. Who will save you from this? Thank God. The answer is Jesus Christ, our Lord. So here's the question. How does Jesus save me? Here's the shift. Jesus saves me with his love, with his love. It wasn't duty that kept him on the cross. It was love. Beloved, let us love one another. Who's writing this? Someone who watched Jesus hang on the cross. He saw it with his own eyes. Beloved, let us love one another for love is from God and whomever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. So many of you have been hurt by the church, hurt by Christians, unloving, sinful, terrible people. Let me tell you something, that's not God. That's their brokenness. That's their mess. God's love wants to teach you three things. Number one, first and foremost, how to love God. One of my favorite thinkers in America today has written an entire commentary on the Bible and says this. He openly says this. His name is Dennis Prager. He says, I do not know how to love God. He has written, he has written the best selling commentary on the scriptures today. No one's even close. And he openly says, I don't know how to love God. You know why? He hasn't been born of it yet. He hasn't met Jesus yet. Next, it teaches you how to love others. Loving others is hard, even people you want to love. Like next time you're in a marriage, just yell, I really want to love you. It's just impossible. <laughs> right? But listen to me. Jesus wants to teach you how to love your enemy. He wants to teach you how to love yourself. Man, that's the hard. I was just Googling songs about loving yourself and Justin Bieber instantly came up. 
And I thought, oh, I wonder what the Bieber has to say about love. You know, his whole song is a mockery about an ex-girlfriend who should just go ahead and love herself. And the song indicates that's a bad thing. I think a lot of us think of self-love as a bad thing. Selfish love is a bad thing. Loving yourself like God loves you is a very, very good thing. But some of you, you just, you've just never come to the place where you said, what on earth did Jesus see in me that he thought was worth dying for? A couple of years ago, I went to an author's conference, a writing conference, and I had written my very first Bible study. And I just got to be honest, I didn't feel like I belonged. I mean, I could just list names of people that were there. And if you read Christian writing at all, they were, they, many of them were there. I mean, big time names. And so I had an interview with Christianity Today, and many of you, you don't know what that is, but it's the largest Christian magazine, and it's a big deal if you're a Christian. You know, it's like Rolling Stone for musicians. This is for Christians. I kid you not, this is how the interview began. I was nervous, but excited. And the interview began with this. I, I, and this is nothing against Christianity Today. I know we have some people from our church that work for them. I love you. But this is what you said. Who are you and why are we interviewing you? That's, that's a pretty rough start, amen? I was embarrassed. I felt defeated. I went home that night and I just got depressed. I felt like I didn't belong. Here's what I believe, like so many of you. I felt like everyone else was special. I was surrounded by all these gifted people and I felt like there was nothing good at all about me. It was a pretty dark moment. Tammy was being the great wife that she is. She was trying to encourage me and we just sat in the hotel next to this just roaring fire. It was in North Carolina. It was a Billy Graham Convention Center and it was just this massive open fire. And we just sat next to it and just like an amazing wife, man, she just held my hand and you know, try to tell me things that I wouldn't listen to, like, I love you, you're amazing to me, you're a great dad, right? All the pick-me-ups. And I wasn't hearing any of it. I wasn't having any of it. I was, I was baptizing in self-loathing. Can you just let me be depressed and discouraged? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, this man came up to me, gray hair, balding, never met him before. And that day, we were in a writer's conference where we were all sitting together and the press was there. People were taking questions. There were hundreds and hundreds of famous writers. And here's what he said to me. He said, you know, earlier when we were in that large gathering and all the writers were together, and I was like, yeah. He said, I couldn't stop staring at you. He said, there was a glow all around you. And the Lord Jesus was telling me to go up to you and speak to you. He said, and I've been struggling with, when is the moment? But I saw you next to the fire and I, and I saw the glow and I said, I got to speak. He said, the Lord told me to tell you that you cannot yet see yourself. And the Lord wants you to know how much he loves you and how much he delights in you and how pleased he is with you. The Lord wants you to know how special you are to him and the Lord can't wait for you to learn to love yourself and he put his hand on my shoulder and then introduced himself he said I'm William P. Young he wrote a book called The Shack and I start crying I'm just wondering if today as you're watching wherever you are Maybe you're in the car driving and you're listening because you couldn't catch church this weekend. Maybe you're sitting at a campus. Maybe you're watching from home. I just wonder if the Spirit of the Lord would just touch your shoulder and say, I've been watching you all day. And I know you don't think there's anything worth, it, worth love in you. I know you're pretty defeated. I know you're pretty sad. But I want to teach you something 
I want to teach you to see yourself, and I want you to see what I love. I know you can't see it. I know you don't believe it. But when I hung on that cross, I didn't just see your sin. I saw what I made you to be. Second Samuel says this, I will call upon the name of the Lord who is worthy to be praised. Listen to this, I'm saved from my enemies. The enemy that Jesus wants to save most of us from today is ourselves. God wants to save me from myself and teach me to love myself, not in some weird self-help yoga pose way, but to teach me to see myself the way that he sees me as a child of God. You know the thing as a parent that hurts me more than anything else when my children cannot see their value. I just wanna grab them and scream, you're so beautiful, you're so amazing. And why can't you see what I see? And the Lord's like, great question. Let's all have a group and talk about it. You see, most of us, here's our struggle in life. We love moments rather than ourselves. We are willing to give up on everything for all eternity for a fleeting moment of impulse, thought, or feeling. But Jesus has a better life for you. So here's the holy shift. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. You see, we all feel like we should love good people, but we shouldn't love bad people. And what happens when you feel bad about yourself? You don't love yourself. But I say to you, love your enemy. Listen to this. And pray for those who persecute you. And you know who that is? You. You. What if you said a prayer like this today? Lord, save me from my critical spirit. Instead of hating myself, would you teach me to truly love myself the way you do? And teach me to see myself as you see me and to begin living the life you have for me. Help me to shift my life. Listen to this, for all eternity, right here, right now. But you know, some of us, we just think there's no way. There's no way. You can't change the past, but you can change for all eternity. I think about the apostle Peter when the Lord Jesus calls him in the ministry. You know what Peter's response is? Listen to these words, Lord, depart from me for I am a sinful man. Oh, but Peter, you're a deeply loved man. Jesus says, come and follow me and I will make you a fisher of men. I will teach you to catch what really matters. Do you know what it is? People who think they're less valuable than a fish. Broken, sinful people who have not yet met me. Come on, Peter, let's go. That's what Jesus is saying right now to you. I found this verse as I was doing my sermon this week in prep, and I just, I just began to weep when I read this. Proverbs is a book of wisdom. Listen to these words. When a man's ways please the Lord. Listen to this. He makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. You wanna become at peace with yourself? Learn to follow the Lord's ways. That's repentance. That's metaneo. That's changing everything. So we're gonna to end today's message with an invitation, whether you're watching from home or you're at a campus. I'm gonna give you an invitation today to surrender to Jesus. Because not only are you your enemy, you're his. But here's the good news. While we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. He died for us. He was willing to do what we can't do, and that's love our enemies. And he moved first, but he's waiting for you to move. Some of you have never surrendered to Jesus in your life. In just a moment, as, as a song plays, I surrender all. I want you, wherever you are, just to stand. If you're driving a car listening to this, maybe you just need to pull over. If you're exercising, listening to this in your, your, your headphones, you just pull over. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing right now, you pull over and you say, I surrender. And as the song plays, when you're ready and you're ready to surrender, I just want you to stand. And I just want you to lift your hand, just say, I surrender. 
I surrender to you, Jesus. Teach me to love what I can't love, and that is myself. That is you, and that is everyone else. Change me. Save me. Help me to love my enemies. When you're ready, as the music plays, you just stand. Let me pray for you right now. Heavenly Father, I pray for all of us. God, it's so easy to be critical. It's so hard to surrender. God, would your Holy Spirit just move in the audience in this place? Would you just help us, Lord, to get a glimpse of what our life could be if we put it in your hands? And so many of us right now are like Peter. We want to pull away. We want to step away. We want to go into a dark corner with our sin. But you are calling. You are moving. Give us the strength to stand, to surrender all. And so many of us, Lord, we call ourselves Christians. And, and, and whether we are or not, Lord, that's between you and them. There's an area of our life we are not letting go of. We've said you can have all but this. Lord, would we surrender that right now when we're ready? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Surrender. 